Welcome to another Kids at Home conversation from Kids at Heart International. And today we'll be focusing on how God can use the spiritual practice of Visio Divina to transform us and the children we care for. And we'll be explaining that Visio Divina, but we'll give you a tip here. Today's conversation is called Worshiping with Our Eyes. And I'd like to add to that our ears too. Well, I'm Gordon West, president of Kids at Heart, and we are delighted to welcome our guest, Scotty May, to join us in this conversation. Not really a guest, She's, she's a returnee, a friend, uh, a professor, an author, uh, a mother, a grandmother, a Kids at Heart board member. She does it all. And uh, even more important, she's one that lives with her eyes wide open, noticing and seeing God at work in our world. And that's what we're really talking about. So welcome, Scotty, and we hope you're doing well this morning in your home in Chicago. Doing great, and it's wonderful to be back. So thanks so much for this opportunity. Oh, we're glad you're here. Well, let's let's start our conversation by remembering a time when we were not able to see something that was right in front of us. Um, Scotty, you're, you're a mom. Did your kids ever call you or you know come to you and to ask you to find something that they thought was lost, only discovered that it was right there in plain view? You know, I've been racking my brain about that because I knew you were going to ask me that. I cannot think of a time. I can't think of a time with my children or my grandchildren. I can think of times when I did it, looking for my glasses when they were on my head or looking for my phone when it was in my pocket. But when I was thinking about something that fits in with Visio Divina, I remember the first time I saw these hidden pictures where you were given a picture and you were oh. supposed to be able to see two things in it. Yes. The first one I remember is the outline of the old woman versus the young woman. Which woman do you see? And eventually I got so I could see two women. They were both there, but I couldn't see them right away. Right. And then you had these other hidden pictures with all the colored dots and you had to stare at them. And eventually a picture would emerge. And that kind of reminded me of my journey with Visio Divina or worshiping with my eyes. So, so it, took, uh, it took a bit to get there. I, you know, um, your children were um, sound like they looked for things better than ours did as they were growing up. Well, and and perhaps I have to throw myself into that category too. As 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 the kids were growing up, my late wife Becky was known to to often say, "You have to look," <laughs> meaning, and she says, "And looking does not mean opening the drawer and shutting it again and saying it's not in there." Um, but it is amazing, uh, you know. I was in this area of, of Visio Divina, I was, I never even heard of this as a younger Christian. And, and now to, as you're saying, to be out and start, start noticing that things uh, are happening around me and that God's hand in them are, uh, is just amazing. So we're going to dig into that. Um, and, and how it, it really gets us started on that next, that next topic uh, Scotty, how did God help you to see this this whole idea of visio divina or worshiping with your eyes, noticing this thing? How did how did you come to really see that as a Christian practice for spiritual formation? What happened for you in that? Well, it was a journey, just like most everything. I am very late to spiritual disciplines, to spiritual practices per se. Um, growing up, we had two disciplines: prayer and Bible study. Right. That, that was it. And so everything else grew up. But what really helped me to start was my mother in that she helped me start noticing. She would help me notice birds, flowers, trees. She'd name them. And so I started looking at detail. I spent hours studying bugs and worms and this kind of thing. And that was an introduction of a door opening. Now, as a sound, very uh, biblical Christian, she never connected that for me to God. Right. But in time it happened. And I began seeing God everywhere. It was just amazing. And uh, uh, now with this springtime here in the Midwest, uh, I live out in the suburbs of Chicago. I, my great granddaughter and I spend a lot of time walking. She's four and a half. And we walk and we talk and we say, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. Isn't God amazing what he did? And just yesterday we were sitting on the glider outside and I said, look at how creative God is. Look at this beautiful world. And she said, oh, isn't it just wonderful? So it's, um, it's something I came to slowly. Let me go a step further. Yeah. I have no art background whatsoever. I'd walk through a museum. I'd look, oh, isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? But about 25 years ago, I read Henry Nouwen's 
return of the prodigal. Yes. Focusing on uh, Rembrandt's uh, painting of the prodigal. And as the book, uh, as Nowen unpacks that painting in the book, I have been struck by how much I never saw. And so reading uh, Nowen's explanation of, of the son, the older son, the servant, and then God the Father. The, the hands. Oh, the hands, the feet, every detail in there. I realized if I learned how to read art, I would be able to read uh, so much more and see God in it. And so that was a huge, huge jump for me to have that book. Well, um, and interestingly in that book, uh, he, he doesn't walk in and look at the picture and write a book. He, he didn't, he, he took, was it weeks or months that he sat there and stared at this picture and noticed things? Well, he brought in a chair. It was in the, uh, in St. Petersburg, Russia, where he was. I don't think he was there for, for months, but he was there a long time. Yeah, a and lot he, of hours looking oh, at that picture. It was days and days and he just sat there and I can't imagine my wiring allow me to do this. <laughs> yes. I, I would have to learn how to think differently, how to really make connections and study and ponder. But my journey has helped me do that. The, uh, I used to teach at Wheaton College, I'm retired now. And on the fifth floor where they have the theology department, they put art up and they put up a Stations of the Cross, which I'm familiar with. I know what that looks like. I've been to many churches and looked at the Stations of the Cross. But in this particular exhibit, they used portraits of people in various postures mm. and different people of the world. And it opened up for me the Stations of the Cross totally differently. And then there was a very startling thing. At the end of the hall is a picture of the crucified Jesus hanging on the cross without the cross. But this image of Jesus is gray dirty. It's shocking. Interesting. And the artist covered this, the figure with vacuum cleaner dust. And as I realized what that artist had been doing and was trying to communicate, it so impacted me that this, this representation shows what Christ did for me by taking my dirt and my dust and that of the whole world on himself. So who would have thought to cover a figure of Jesus with vacuum cleaner dust but my, how that started speaking to me. So it's and the been creativity of the artist. Oh, oh, it's just incredible. Just incredible. You know, as you, as you mentioned the childhood part, I, I, that, I think that was my first experience again, not labeled as yours was I, as a child, I, I loved insects. And then I, I remember seeing it again through the eyes of a child when, when we were at uh, summer camp and, you know, we, we would run about a hundred children at camp and there was one little girl who had severe learning disabilities. She could not stay with us on most things. And she was, she was probably only about seven at the time. And, and what we noticed was if we went on a walk, you know, any of our hikes, we had to watch her because if there was a bug in the road, she would stop. She couldn't focus on most things, but she could stare at a bug forever. And her delight and what she got out of that I didn't know yet how to model, how to, how to label that, but now I can look and see she, she was noticing. And, yeah. you know, for me, uh, it, I think it became more apparent. Um, so uh, being raised in America as a, a, an artistically bent male is not necessarily an easy upbringing. That, that's our society does not encourage men to be uh, creative and artistic a lot of times, at least not, not where I grew up. Um, but during the time that that I was losing my, you know, Becky took three years of, of fighting cancer that, that we fought that together. Music became so important to me and, and it, it opened a language of, of the heart to me that, that I realized this was my lifeline to God that, that, I mean, and it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily praise songs. Um, there were times that just putting classical music on was something that my soul needed and that drew me back to God. Um, and so to me, I, I, I add to this Visio Divina idea. It's, it's really, I, I think it's like art Divina. It's like beauty Divina because it's, it, because creation also, it's God's art. It's, it's also the artist's art. 
Um, there's, I, I've been reading, I mentioned to you, I've been reading um, Chasing Francis, um, just a, a fascinating book. It's a, it's a, it, it calls itself a wisdom literature. It's a fictitious story wrapped with lots of history. And a, a quote from it is, uh, it says, the object of all great art is beauty, and it makes us nostalgic for God. Whether we consider ourselves people of faith or not, art arouses in us what the Pope calls a universal desire for redemption. And so there's something, there's something in beauty and noticing it where, where whoever creates it um, that I, I think is just incredibly spiritual. And let's, let's, let's keep unpacking that. You know, um, we know that the spirit of God can use this practice as, as a means to nurture our, our love relationship with him. And that's what we want for our children. We, 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 we really desire kids at heart, as, as you know, Scotty, to, to have kids fall deeply in love with Jesus. And they're just, there are a lot of ways that they can do that, um, that you and I didn't get taught as we were growing up. They're just, there are a lot of rich, wonderful ways that are especially approachable for kids. So let's, let's define this one. Um, when you're going to try to explain and define this, you know, worshiping through your eyes or Visio Divina uh, to a child, what would you say? What kind of what kind of explanation would you have for them? Well, I guess I wouldn't start trying to define it with a young child. I would just live it and model it so it would be caught. And then as the child got older, let's find a name for this. Uh, I like the Adele Calhoun in her book, uh, Handbook of Spiritual Formation. She says, it is to worship God through beauty of created things. Mm -hmm. And I would start with something like that. Look at what God has created. How can we worship God this way? So I would start much more lived life, uh, probably until the child got old enough to really understand practices, which can be upper elementary or that kind of thing. But man, are they able to do that. And as I was thinking about this topic to talk about it today, I realized if we are worshiping God through the beauty of created things, it, there's a sequence here. The creation that God has done, all of creation is, is my prime way of connecting with him. But then because of the creation that God has done, we have creators, human creators, who do art, who do music, uh, who do making films, who do uh, all kinds of, uh, who dance in beautiful ways that help me draw, uh, get drawn into God's presence. And then I myself can do some kind of creation. So there's a sequence of the creator, um, human creators, and then me as creator. Um, and what can I make that represents what I have just seen? What can I say? What can I draw? That kind of thing. And, and so I, I would have children do that kind of thing. Draw me a picture of how you think God made this. Or why do you think God did something that looks like this? And just uh, make it the way you feel when you see this. So letting the children know that they can become creators on a different level and uh, have that be a way that they can worship God. Let me add just a little story here. I, uh, I work with uh, tweens at my church. And we have a small group now post pandemic. We're back in person, but we're still masked and social distance. And we've had a theme all year of Psalm one. And so this last week, two days ago, I asked these gals as a review of it to put their heads together after they sat alone with the passage, which they were very familiar with and just thought about it. Then I gave them a six foot long piece of paper, three foot by six foot. And I said, work together and draw Psalm one. So here they were taking what God has given us and being creators of it. And they just did a beautiful job of representing the righteous person and the wicked person and the chaff and, and uh, letting themselves express creativity, which I think is a way of worshiping God as well. Scotty, I, um, in high school, became a Christian and got very involved in theater and actually went off to UCLA to get a theater degree out of a very conservative church. I didn't get a lot of affirmation to go be creative that way. So I, I love how, how you put that, that, you know, when we remember God's the creator and the artist is, is creating things, however good or bad it is, does not matter no. at our level, but, the, but the creation and the creativity that we are showing part of God's image. I mean, yes. it's, this is a good thing. There's, there's, 
it's a wonderful thing. Um, you know, C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory said this, I love this, the books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them, it only came through them. And what came through them was longing for they are not the thing itself, they are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. And I just love that thought of when we encounter that. Well, this is, this is so true. We're, we're going to talk about scripture later, but when Romans talks about the creation, you know, drawing us to God, well, as you said, even the human creation and of beauty reminds us and has that same pull, maybe not quite as strong, but, but there's still that beauty in whatever's created that it says, so let's go back to the creator and, and worship him. So. And you were talking about creation of beauty and what just popped into my head, there can be creation of horror. There can be creation that depicts the pain, the wounds, yes. um, the problems of the world, which can also draw us to God. Yes. So the creation doesn't have to be just a beauty. It is an expression of the soul. Um, and that can become a worship form back to God too. And to me, I, I almost put those both in the, in like the category of depth. It's, it's like substance and meaning. And there's just, there's something there. You know, I, I, I talk about, I, I don't really enjoy a movie that I don't feel something. You know, I, if I, if I'm going to pay $75, how much is it now <laughs> so, to go to a movie? I, I want there to be, I, I want to laugh or I want to cry and, and both have some depth and, and some, some sense of drawing that, and yes, art or music or a picture or any of the things. It, there are times um, out on hikes for me that, that seeing uh, for us, saguaro cacti are very precious to see a dead saguaro. Um, or to see where Arizona had terrible wild, wildfires the last couple of summers and to see a, a, an area just burned up is, is kind of that same thing where it's like, wow, this is the destruction of, of the fall and yet it draws us back to God. Mm -hmm. But I love what you share about, yes, if, if we just got kids started on this, they are so good at noticing things and enjoying things and feeling things when we give them permission. Yes. Um, and don't assume they're wasting time because they sit in there, study the anthill. Uh, you know, in, a, in the resource guide that accompanies this talk, we call that godly gazing. Um, just, yeah. Uh, neat, neat phrase. Noticing what God's doing through, through whatever creation is, is around us. Um, and that, that part we talked about now and sitting for however many hours looking at the painting, um, and, and again, in the resource guide, I love a phrase that our, our Becky Dietz put in it. We look until we are surprised by God <laughs> at whatever we're looking to or listening to or reading, whether it's a poem or a, a photograph of nature or nature itself or whatever. Yeah, we look until we are surprised by God. And children can get surprised by God quite quickly because they are good noticers. Yes, yes. And sometimes the surprise comes very quickly. Suddenly, yes. it can overwhelm. I, I can remember a couple of, of situations where the one of the first times I went skiing in the mountains, I was in um, Utah, and I think it was uh, Alta, and was up at the top of the ridge as a beginner. There was an easy way to get down, but I got off the lift and turned around, and I saw range after range after range of mountains, and it was just breathtaking because I had never in person seen a view like that. And it just startled me. So that was a sudden spectacular sense of God's awe. But then another time I was um, in Yosemite, which I'd never been to before. I was doing a workshop at a camp near Yosemite and I had the afternoon off. So I thought I'm going to drive into Yosemite because I've never been there. So I drove, I realized now I was going in a back entrance, went around winding roads, saw the big giant tree forest and yes. came around. And all of a sudden I took a turn and there was an opening in the trees and there was a vista that had El Capitan and Half Dome in the same, same view. And it just, ah, oh! <laughs> you know, nobody was there to hear me gasp in awe, but it was just like, wow, God, you have done such an amazing job. Uh, worship and praise is my only response. 
I, I was thinking maybe it would have been good for someone else to be there to drive as, as you're shocked. Been, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't heavily trafficked, but I, I did have to pull over and just look. So it was wonderful. <laughs> I, I want to read one more quote from Chasing Francis because I, I just, the arts are so important to me. This whole idea of noticing um, the creation uh, is so important. And, and, I, and I think it's timely. This, this book says something I think is amazing. The church is realizing there is an awareness of God sleeping in the basement of the postmodern imagination, and they have to awaken it. The arts can do this. All beauty is subversive. I love this. Um, in, in theater, we talked about we, we could put into a comedy really hard-hitting messages because people were laughing and they would get it. But so this, this is all art is is uh, the arts can do this. All beauty is subversive. It flies under the radar of people's critical filters and points them to God. As a friend of mine says, when the front door of the intellect is shut, the back door of the imagination is open. Our neglect of the power of beauty and the arts helps explain why so many people have lost interest in church. Our coming back to the arts will help renew that interest. And, and children love the arts. Um, yes, they certainly do. But it's interesting, even, even as, as you talk about not necessarily defining Visio Divina for them, we don't need to define the arts either. No, we, right. We, you know, you don't, don't tell a little boy we're going to dance now because there may be baggage to that, but we can creatively move to music and just have fun and, and do something like that. People so. certainly danced in scripture. So if there's baggage, we better check our baggage. Yes. Yes. But, <laughs> but on the same, I think there's, there's probably some baggage on Visio Divina in general in the church, but when we experience it and meet God, we go, wait, 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 that baggage needs to go right. away. Yeah. We, yeah. I, and I, I think you're bringing up an important thing. I did not know the term Visio Divina until probably the last six to eight years. And that's pretty late in my uh, journey, my, my faith journey. But the concept of Visio Divina is so ancient, it's holy seeing. And when you go back uh, to the early church, they had to do things visually because most people were illiterate. So they visualized. And then in, during the Middle Ages, they did it through stained glass windows. So yes. they created these gorgeous windows to tell the biblical story so that people could sit and look and see the text, see the narrative of scripture. And um, it's, it's just amazing what people did through the arts, through, through the classic artists, and through the way they made their um, worship structures all visually glorify God. But then we get to the Reformation, and we stripped all of that away, and then we get to the Enlightenment, and we assumed that we got things much better through words than we did through what we see. Um, so there's been a huge um, injustice, in my view, to, to visual worship. We, uh, I kind of, kind of grew up that if you looked at icons, you were worshiping idols. Yes. But iconography was you, you are to read the icon because the icon is telling you a story about God. And so people who have been informed how to read icons need see the biblical story. And some traditions are heavy with icons. And I caught that, oh, we don't ever do that. We don't exactly. look at the image of God. Um, and what? how deprived we are when we don't look at images. Um, when I was doing a, a research project, I visited lots of churches. And so many of the churches and the tradition I grew up in are stripped of anything visual, anything artistic, uh, even windows. So I can't even look out at the clouds. They look like black auditoriums. Why? So we can focus on a person rather than something that lets our imagination see God. So. I think we've done a big disservice to the church yes. by uh, allowing whatever was the problem in the Reformation days to strip our churches of everything that would be a visual symbol. Yes, as, as so often is the case, we swung the pendulum way too far. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and we're not saying that everything was bad. It, it, far from it. There were things that needed to be reformed. Sure, but, sure. But, but that piece, unfortunately, um, you know, it's interesting to think that uh, 
God himself didn't rely just on words to communicate with us. He sent his son in a physical form that we could observe. And, and there just, there are times that, um, that our, our sight and our experience is so much more powerful than, than the he, word alone. But he also spoke through fire. He created a bush yes. that kept burning. So there are many ways that, uh, uh, Holy God used visual concrete things to help us connect with him. Yes, and we don't have time here, but I, I could tell you the number of times that God has spoken to me personally through a deer and and just- um, The animal with four legs or a deer yes. person? Well, deer persons very frequently also, but all no, the animal with four legs where um, I, I needed that confirmation that God was with me. I was on a trail once, uh, just about two years ago and turned a corner and a, a fawn was there and actually came within five feet and stood there munching grass, totally unafraid of me. And I mean, the, the, the thing that welled up inside of me, I, it, it wasn't even like I was thinking, I was just watching this young fawn, the tenderness. And I, I just said, I love you too, God. Oh. It was just, it was what, came up in me noticing and it wasn't hard to notice i mean this was very unusual this this fawn that wasn't scared of me on a on a trail like this but you know these we've talked about a, a couple of misconceptions or bad practices in this whole area you know where this has gotten pushed aside but are there are there other things that uh we need to avoid and watch out with children and adults about this spiritual practice I, I think we want to be careful that we don't neglect the word, the printed word, uh, that we show our children, uh, young as they are, um, how the connection between visual holiness and written holiness, Lectio Divina, how those two are connected. So I think a, a problem would be if we stick to one or the other. And because I'm now retired, I get to spend so much more with my time with my great granddaughter. And so we're reading a, a book on uh, Bible basics, which has counts to 10. And she can read much of it herself now. One oh, God, wonderful. two persons, three, the Trinity, four, the four gospels. And, and it's very carefully helping her connect word with biblical truth. And it's just a delight to be able to do that. Uh, that's yes, that's wonderful. And you know, as you talk about um, not neglecting uh, again from chasing Francis, that some of their challenges that um, it, the that the story of the gospel and the truth of the scripture is so important that they're challenging today's Christians to be creative in how we express it. How can we share this um, in a way that that does, uh, you know, get in that back door of creativity and into the heart so that people will listen and notice and, and hear the word through the creativity. Yeah, yeah. So. And another thing I think it's helpful for us to do, uh, if we are part of a church tradition that has more of the Spartan um, worship space, I think to take our children to a more elaborate worship space and, and let them see uh, what you might call a cathedral or uh, a more liturgical space and how there are so many symbols and what those symbols mean so that our children can get an appreciation for different kinds of space. I'm not saying abandon the space that you're part of just because it's Spartan, but to show ways, other ways that people worship. I'll never forget out being in your territory for a board meeting and we had that board meeting at a Presbyterian church, I believe it was on the outskirts of Phoenix. And yes. somebody had said, you need to go see the worship center. Well, okay, I've seen lots of worship centers. We walked into that space and I wanted to get down on my knees. There was the entire front of the church in brilliant colors, the throne uh, of the end of all peoples worshiping around the throne. And on another side was another picture of that. It was the most powerful visual, visio divina that I encountered in a long time. I was trying to figure out how could we get a slide of that to show in this um, webinar so that people could see what kind of worship art can be done that just brings you into the presence of the holy. Uh, it was spectacular, I'll never forget it. I, I bet we can um, dub a, a URL that people could go look at a, a picture of that church. So we'll we'll ask Allison, our 
tech guru to do that for us because it is they're they're not just um really well done stained glass they're also huge so they're just yes. majestic and overpowering uh, another place we've we've had retreats if you remember had a, a fellowship hall with just a wall of glass looking out over the the valley of the desert and uh, a part on the east side of phoenix that you could see what we call four sisters mountains and 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 again it's 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 totally different and yet they've used creation in that sense to be able to just look and and it's it's hard you don't notice the rest of the room with the glass you're just staring out at what god has done it's amazing well um what's what <laughs> What sort of scriptural foundation is there for this, Scotty? I, you know, you and I both have have friends who would be a little concerned about this, and you know, that's this wasn't our upbringing. Is 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 it biblical? Um, are there places in the Bible that says it's okay to worship with our eyes and to look at at these beautiful stained glass or look at creation and think that we're worshiping God? Well, you don't ever find the words visio divina in scripture. No, but. <laughs> from my perspective, once I had eyes to see how I can worship through my eyes, it's scattered throughout scripture, through both testaments, particularly in the, in the Psalms, Psalms 8. Um, let me read just a little bit of Psalm 8 to you. I have it marked here um, because I just think it's so tremendous. When I consider the heavens and the work of your fingers, the sun and the stars, which you have set in place, who are we that you are mindful of us? the son of man that you care for us. You made us a little lower than heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. And it goes on and on to talk about how God rules through the things that he's done and the majestic things. We have Psalm 19. We have Psalm 121. I'll lift up my eyes into the hills. Um, the strength that I get from looking at the hills knows, helps me know that God is my rock and my foundation. Uh, then there's Isaiah. <laughs> Isaiah 40 verse 26 lift your eyes and look to the heavens who created all these who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls them each by name because of his great power and might and strength not one of them is missing so just taking a child okay i live in chicago we have about three stars um so i would have to drive about 50 miles to get far enough away from city lights taking a blanket and taking my great granddaughter and laying down at night and looking yes. up at the sky and just praising God for the majesty of the stars. I don't see them often here, but I was down in the Southern hemisphere down in uh, Honduras. The first time I was in South America, Central America, and I looked up the Southern sky. I had never seen it. And it was just spectacular. Another time to just praise God, but we can go to the new Testament as well. You have the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus himself says, look at the birds, look at the lilies. Don't worry, look at how I've clothed them. They're marvelous. So that's in chapter six of uh, uh, Matthew. And then John four, where uh, Jesus also says, look at the fields, how they're white into harvest. So, so the Lord Jesus uses general creation, what we can see to teach us all kinds of lessons and then, as you mentioned earlier, Romans 1, creation shows us God. And the God that has created all this is available to the entire world to see God. And that's why some people can come to know him without ever hearing a word. They just find isn't, him. Isn't creation. that amazing? I yeah. love those stories. Yeah. Um, well, and as, as you talk about Jesus saying, look at the, look at the flower, look at the field, isn't he? isn't he really just giving instructions for worshiping with your eyes? It's like, understand Absolutely. who God is by seeing this, Absolutely. you know? And so he's, he's really, he's, he's talking exactly about what we're talking about today. Yes. So, so those 75 verses you just gave us, I, I, I guess from that, you do believe it is supported in scripture. Absolutely. <laughs> Look, even, even, even the Lord's supper, even our communion uses common elements to represent incredible biblical truths that we can use to worship our God. Yes, and how meaningful. So for those from a more conservative tradition, think about what happens in you as you watch a, a pastor break the bread, if, if you do that, and, and just thinking about what that means, what that represents, and how that you know, is, is a terrible thing. As you said, that's one of those tragedies that was the gift. It's the wonderful, horrible gift. 
Um, so yeah, beautiful kinds of things. You know, in, in Psalm 119, you, you mentioned that, but there's that phrase, open mine eyes. And um, it, it's, it's so clear from that, that the psalmist isn't asking God to literally open his eyes. He's asking him to give him eyes that can really understand what he's looking at. And so if we can, you know, that's just a wonderful prayer. I, 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 I do truly, I enjoy going out hiking and saying, God, please show me yourself today in some way. And just being expectant at what, what he will do and knowing that he's the author of that. Well, I, you know, we've touched upon some of these, but, um, it, let me ask you specifically, what are the benefits of this for us, for leaders and parents? Um, is it important for those parents out there, those grandparents, those great grandparents? Um, is, is this important to do? How will their children, grandchildren, great grandchildren benefit from us helping them ex explore this? Well, for me, the thing that it does that has the greatest impact, impact on me is that it evokes in me a sense of awe and wonder. And the research has shown that the spiritual formation of children is greatly enhanced by awe and wonder. And so having that, oh, that there's something bigger than myself, uh, th that I can wonder about how God has done this, why God has done this, why are we so privileged to have these kinds of things? So I think without a sense of awe and wonder, we are um, impoverishing ourselves and our children. And the more media saturated, the more rational we become, the more word oriented we assume we should be. I think the more we allow the shrinkage of our imagination and our ability to have awe and wonder. So we need both, we need both. I've actually heard um, research was also done that the overemphasis of doctrine squelches awe and wonder. Yes. Yes. So we, we need to keep that in balance. Yes, the truth, but also the, the mystery. You know, and that, you can do that. You can teach a truth, but then ask the child to artistically represent it. How would you sing about that? Yes. Could you write a story about that? Could you make a poem? Could you draw a picture of that proposition? Um, propositional truth is not relational. It was, and it was frankly one of one of my um, almost didn't get out of seminary experiences because to to go through my orals, there were just some questions that I thought if I can give you a really clear answer to that question. I, I don't think I'm describing God because I think God is bigger than having a clear answer to that question. Um, you know, and, and I think a child is, is oftentimes so much more comfortable with that, yes. uh, with, with the unknown, but the mystery and, and welcoming it. And we get uncomfortable, but we, we don't need to. We want um, to manage truth. <laughs> yes. We yes. want to contain it and know it. And make sure the child gets it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, 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 to, to help a child with all of this too, to just get them in the, the sense of giving credit where credit is due and, and seeing God as the source of all these fascinating things around them. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I think it gets a, a child off to that great start of recognizing God's presence, recognizing their dependence, recognizing God's sovereignty and an awesome mystery. And um, it, it just starts them out right. So and I think it requires us to be vulnerable and willing to be humble enough to say, wow, I can't believe God did this, you know, and, and talking through that whole process. And that gives the child permission to have that same kind of thing uh, and talk about how I learned it growing up and what I didn't learn yes. growing up and yes. what difference it makes now that I know this. Yes. And uh, that's something I always want to remind parents that um, we don't have to have it perfect and, and our own journey, our stories are helpful to kids to go, oh, okay, I didn't understand it yesterday either, but now I do. So now I can, now I can do this. So, so you've, you've shared some wonderful ideas about how to engage kids with this, how to introduce it to them. Are there, are there other things that come to your mind that can be helpful? Yes, expose them to art and um, go to the museum in your community, whether it's a wonderful world-class museum or just a a humble one, but expose them to art. And now with the what you can get online, it can be beautiful. Talk with your children. I wouldn't do this with real young children. 
through the classic art as represented by Michelangelo and, and Rembrandt, but then also go to ethnic art, art from mm. different people groups, how they see beauty, how they saw creation, how they saw the nativity and balance it. If we only do classic art, it tends to be from one culture, from one people group, but if we broaden it so that they can see all peoples are creative and they express that creativity differently, but it's beautiful. And, so, and while you're while you're mentioning the art museums, Scotty, I, I have to mention those that live in Southern California, the Getty Museum, yes. uh, which I, I, I've been to several times uh, having been a UCLA grad, but I'll tell you my favorite um, tour there is the tour of the of the landscaping. And to have this tour to explain why this tree is here and why that bush is there and what the characteristics are. And who knew that the outdoors was part of the work that, that is on display. And so be creative, look, look to those, um, those museums to see what all they have to offer. There may be just little nuggets of surprise about, about what's available. Lovely connection there, beautiful. Going to a tree museum is also really cool, <laughs> which would be like your uh, arboretums. Uh, places yes. where you see nature designed and naturally just in spectacular ways. God is everywhere. We just need eyes to see how great and majestic he is. Yeah, I, I like, uh, and we mentioned in the resource guide, you know, we all have these big coffee table books that are basically just dust collectors. Those can be wonderful things to pull out and open with your children and allow them to actually leaf through. And who cares if the pages get a little damaged because sitting on your coffee table isn't doing a whole lot of good anyway. Um, but oftentimes we have these these beautiful works just available in our homes. Or there's there's a one of the major international banks, I don't know if this is done everywhere, but here in town has a once a month free museum. Uh, so, you know, um, to, to look for those kinds of opportunities for young families to be able to go and experience. And if it's free and it's, you know, you go and it's not great, that's okay. Um, you didn't spend anything, but you, you, can, you can observe something, so. Yeah, you don't need to call it Visio Divina if that term bothers you, but just call it looking and seeing God everywhere. Yeah, seeing and I'd add hearing. Um, just oh, yes, yes. Whatever but... happens with that. Um, well, Scotty, this has been a delight. Um, once again, thank you so much for joining us. And we want to remind our listeners to download the resource guide from the website. And the website is uh, kidsathome.org. That's kids with a Z at home.org. And, and we encourage you, we invite you, we ask you to share that guide with your ministry leaders, with families, with household leaders. Um, because it is free, it's reproducible, it's, it's there to, to bless and help. And then we'd also encourage you to uh, come join us at Transforming Kids Ministry Facebook group. Uh, it's a great place for you to ask questions, post pictures. We'd love to know about your next trip to the museum or, or what your kids spotted on your walk around the neighborhood. Um, so tell us your stories. If you have a picture to share, that'd be great. Um, if you find a, in fact, this would be a, a great one. If you, if you go online and, and find a picture that's the, and, and, and practice this and God speaks to you, sh clip, clip that picture posted at transforming kids ministry and tell us what God said to you. We'd love to hear those stories and rejoice with you. Um, Scotty, would you bless us with a benediction? Would you close us and just help us to go from here? I would be happy to, but if you don't mind, I'd like to do it in a way that I never grew up with, but it's a blessing where you leave your eyes open. And um, it's something I say regularly. So I don't always say the same, I don't always say new words every time I pray, but may I bless you with this blessing. That would be wonderful. May the light of God shine over you. May the Holy Spirit fill you. May the blood of Jesus cover you. May you go in peace and may you always know just how much the Lord Jesus loves you. Thank you for the privilege of being here today. Thank you, Scotty. And thank you listeners for being with us. Um, as is our, our habit, we're going to give you a few minutes with some quiet time with God to ask him how he might have you use this for your own spiritual formation and for the children that you love, the, those, whether they're in your classroom or your home or your extended family. And um, just spend these next few moments worshiping with your eyes and your ears. Thanks for being with us and God bless. Mm -hmm.